And so we've prepared this event in a way that we have two parts to it. So we'll do two presentations. Amos will give a presentation a bit about Teapot's work and what the opportunities are, how to market your film, looking at film festival strategies, especially for short films. And then Ian will give a presentation about his insights into new technologies, specifically VR, and also looking a bit into AI and where the opportunities lie there for new filmmakers. And I think we should go straight into the presentation. We'll have a couple of questions at the end of each presentation, just to clarify any, any questions you may have from the presentation. And then at the end, we can have a more general discussion and we'll be taking um, audience Q&As as well. And I think we'll, uh, Amos, yeah. and I think we'll sit on the sides of it and okay, watch the presentation. Sure. Great. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me from Water Sprite and all the people involved. Uh, Bernadette, Catherine, Katie, everyone. It's, it's really a great uh, opportunity for students to meet each other, to meet the industry, and to learn a little bit more about what you can do with your films once you've actually made the films. So, um, as we said, my name is Amos Gemma, I'm the International Manager for Teaport, which is an online market for student films and short films. Um, I'm going to brush through a little bit about what we do and where we come from as an organization, and then I'm going to go deeper into um, what you can do to try and better find your audience and what different tools are out there for you, not only ours, but also just different things to open your thoughts to, to think about when approaching distribution. So, um, as I said, Teapot is an online platform. We promote and facilitate distribution, but we're not a VOD platform or a distributor. So we're basically a tool that students and schools can use to interact with the film industry. Um, just a short history of where we come from. Uh, Teapot is part of the Tel Aviv Student Film Festival, which is uh, one of the most established, uh, largest uh, student film festivals in the world, established in 1986. And basically it was created to make a network for different film schools to interact with the industry. Um, it's a B2B platform, if you don't know what that means, that's basically meaning that we're not open to the public. Um, we're not a VOD, as I said. Uh, we are only working with professionals to get to know the films on the platform. So basically if I'm a distributor, sales agent, um, festival programmer, or even producer or talent scout looking to see the next talent, I can access that on the platform and then contact directly the people that I'm interested in working with or in getting their films. Um, just as a raise of hands, how many here are student filmmakers? Okay, and the, and the rest are uh, industry related professionals or just curious viewers of the festival? Okay, never mind. <laughs> uh, so there are a few challenges, uh, and this is uh, something that we face that's maybe important for you guys to know. Film schools do function actually as short film production companies. In the end, they produce such a vast amount of short films that they can't always distribute them in a, a most efficient way. And some films do get lost in the process. Um, basically, it's a mixture of lack of resources or actually also a lack of will to focus on that because most schools actually want to teach you filmmaking. Um, which you can argue whether that's good or not, but the fact of the matter is is that a lot of students end up having a film that they're a little bit lost about where to send it, what to do with it, and how to get it to your audience. Um, if you relate to that, we might be able to help. From the industry perspective, it's difficult finding student films because it's typically difficult to know who owns the rights, who do I need to contact to get the films, is it the student, is it the school, is it half-half, is it a distributor who's actually external to the school at all, and typically for industry professionals, when it's too complicated, they just leave it because there's so many other films that they need to watch that actually do reach them. Um, and that's where we try and help. And for the students themselves, it's a bit of lack of experience and knowledge about how the film industry works, which is what we're going to talk a little bit about in a moment. So yeah, this I already explained, but we work with film schools and students and we contact um, either people searching for the shorts or for the new talent. These are our advisory board. Um, if you don't know, Francois Morizette uh, is a, a distributor of short films. His company, Salut de Morizette, just um, distributed the Oscar winner, Skin, who uh, won the uh, short Oscar just, I think, a week ago. 
Uh, Kathleen McLennes is a festival strategist and publicist. She uh, also programs for many different festivals. She used to program for Palm Springs, for Hot Dogs, for TIFF. Uh, she works now with Seattle and she's very well known in the industry. Anne Parent is the head of the Clermont Ferrand um, short film market, which is the largest short film market in the world. Um, and Elvin Schmidt is a German producer. He worked with uh, uh, Wim Winders on uh, Pina 3D. They each represent a different aspect of the industry that we find important for um, the way we do things and we, we get advice from them, they support what we do and they also know the films that uh, we promote. These are some of the main collaborations that we've done in the last year. Um, we uh, have opened a collaboration with Arte, which is the French-German broadcaster, um, in promoting uh, short films uh, to the German market. Um, I don't know how many of you know different film festivals, but Les Arcs is a, a very important European film festival um, that takes place every year in the French Alps, um, and it's mostly focused on the first and second feature films. Uh, we've done a collaboration there with something called the Talent Village, which is basically an opportunity for uh, first feature filmmakers. So if you've made a short as a student and you want to make your first feature, this is a place where you can start developing it and get some feedback from the industry. Um, and they were using Teapot to select projects and actually the winning projects that got 5,000 euros to develop their first feature was from our platform. Uh, we work with the Torino short film market in Italy, uh, one of the most important uh, short film markets as well. Um, and with Vimeo we have collaborations both from the technological side and also from the staff picks promotional side. Um, and this is just a short information of what filmmakers actually get from joining Teapot. There's the industry exposure, uh, which includes A-list festivals. We work with different programmers, such as programmers from Venice, Tribeca, Clermont, uh, Cannes, many different others. Also exclusive opportunities, as I mentioned, from the partnerships, promotion to the leading markets, direct contact with the professionals, because there's no filter. So basically, um, they watch what they're looking for. So there's a, a tag catalog system. If they're looking for a film that's 8 minutes or 14 minutes or 25 minutes, they can find it. If they're looking for a specific genre, a specific category, they can find it very easily. Um, yeah, and of course, a movie page where you can uh, promote the film. So, now what? Uh, you've made a short film. You are either in your last year of school or graduated freshly, and you want to get your film to your audience. So, where is your audience? Is it in short film festivals, is it in cinemas, is it in TV? Who are you trying to reach with your short films? I think that that's a question that is important for young filmmakers to ask themselves. Whether this is an independent short or a student short, it doesn't really matter. But there are different places where you can reach your audience. So let's start with the obvious, which is film festivals. Film festivals, just maybe I'm gonna ask you guys to, to shout out like names of festivals that you've heard of that you know or that you want to send your films to. What do you think of? Feel free to just shout out. Venice, Rotterdam, okay. Uh, others? Berlin, Cannes. Berlin, Cannes, Sundance, it's great. All amazing festivals, each one of them. But there are literally hundreds of film festivals that are not in our minds when we think about where is a good place for me to show my film. And I'm not saying anything against the big festivals. The big festivals have their respect and honor in place. But for short films and student films, sometimes it's very easy to get lost in a big film festival. And if you're in Berlin or in Cannes with a short film, you're not the biggest fish. You're not the most interesting filmmaker and you're not the most interesting film. Because, of course, they have the other uh, bigger competitions and sections. However, there are many festivals where young filmmakers and short filmmakers can really get a stage. Just to name a few, uh, Clermont Ferrand, Palm Springs Short Fest, many others, uh, Torino actually is another good example, where you can really get a good stage as a short filmmaker um, to present your film to the industry and to actually get contacted by sales agents, TV buyers, people who are gonna bring your film to the audience. Moving on, just to talk about cinemas. Um, raise your hand if you thought that your short film can be shown in cinema. Right. <laughs> but actually, there are distributors that sell short films to cinema in many different countries. Uh, they do this in Italy, Israel, Germany, 
and I'm sure that somebody's doing this in the UK, but I'm less familiar with the UK, I must admit. Um, they do this as programs, so basically they program a, a group of four or five shorts, and they go at it the same way a theatrical distributor would sell a feature-length film. So basically, you're getting to share the screen with three or four other films, but you can actually reach an audience in cinema. TV as well. Um, almost every European broadcaster has a short film uh, bio section. Uh, I'm sure in, in the UK you know all the options, because most of you are, I guess, from here. Um, but you should be aware that um, in Belgium, Spain, Italy, Germany, France, they're all TV buyers that are interested in short films. The question is only how you reach them, because they typically don't work with filmmakers directly. They typically watch films through distributors or sales agents, sometimes through festivals, or platforms as ours, because it works as a market, basically. Um, and then, more focusing now on online, where is a good place for me to have my film online? And when is a good time to have it online? Because Often you are met with this dilemma, if I put my film now on YouTube or Vimeo, uh, am I risking festival opportunities or sales opportunities? The answer is probably yes, but there are times where it might be actually better for you to reach your audience online rather than wait two years for a festival to pick up your short, and maybe in this time you could get enough exposure and enough audience to help you make your next film. So it really is worth thinking what is the audience that you're trying to reach right now? And for this specific film that you have, what would be a good way to, to reach that? Um, Ian's going to be talking more about VR, so I'm not going to go too much into that. But um, there are many other opportunities that are not the classical, traditional, uh, theatrical way that you should also have in mind. Um, this is typically more relevant to, to creating projects because I guess it's more rare that a, a classical short film would become a VR project, but more in when you're planning your next project, are you having in mind interactive cinema or um, VR? And uh, just to quickly conclude before um, my part is done and we can open to questions, or, or do we do the questions at the end? Some questions. Okay. Um, so there's a few points which are worth thinking about, uh, which is what do you actually want to tell? Um, short films are never just one kind of short films. There is generally a separation between people who make short films because they want it as a calling card, so I'm going to make something that's going to prove my ability as a filmmaker or prove the story I want to tell. And typically, it's worth taking in consideration that you can't tell everything in a short film, and then you also have to think about the length. There are also the other uh, people looking at short films as poems, so basically, there should be nothing wrong with making a nine minute short rather than 30 minutes because a poem can be just as powerful in nine minutes uh, rather than in 30 minutes. Um, another question is, is this art house or entertainment? Um, I know this is something that's not always a clear line or a separation, but you should have that in mind when you're looking for your audience, what kind of short film am I making here? What kind of films do I want to make in the future? And then plan accordingly the audience outreach that you want to do. And yeah, empathy. I guess that was relevant to VR, but I'm going to leave that <laughs> also to, to Ian. Uh, so, this is what I'm bringing you today. Uh, if you are interested in uh, joining as an independent student um, to uh, the platform, it's not yet possible. But we are having a pre-registration, so you can sign up and then you'll be on our list. In June, we're going to be opening it up. So, if you want to have a, let's say, first look to that option, you can definitely do that, or you can also write me if you have questions or um, thoughts about what we do. Uh, and if there's any questions, I'm happy to take them. I have some questions. We all sit down with yeah. you in the front, and sure. I'll come back and ask some general questions about it. Yeah. So, first of all, I have one very essential question. Now, do you think that you can make money with a short film? Um, a uh, I'll say two answers. Uh, absolutely yes, um, but that shouldn't be the goal that you're making the short film. Um, Do you think more as a calling card? Well, I'm, let's. Um, I'll, I'll give my personal experience. I also used to be a, a student uh, filmmaker in the past, and I also uh, used to make uh, short films. And uh, for example, with my thesis film, we managed to sell it to uh, two different TV channels. Uh, we had it in many different festivals. 
Uh, sometimes you get screening fees from festivals, sometimes you get awards. There are different ways to make money from it, but you're not going to become rich from it. Um, but it might help you make your next film. Um, and definitely, if, if your goal is to make money with short films, that's probably not the best place to be. Um, but don't, don't look at it as something worthless, because it has also financial value. Um, and so when we're looking at audience more generally, do you find it more interesting to find your audience through festivals or through distribution? Because I can imagine that it's a lot more difficult to have the short film being distribute, distributed as it is to have it in one of the festivals. And I saw a statistic that there are 4,000 film festivals in the world, so knowing which ones are the A-list festivals, which are second, third tier, can be quite hard to navigate your way. So how, how do you think it's just from your personal experience, but what is the better way to find an audience through those two routes? Right, that, that's a great question. I think that um, <laughs> w one of the reasons that Teapot was created is because there's simply not enough tools for students mm -hmm. to um, access the world of, of distribution and, and, and festivals. Uh, you spend most of your studies learning about making a film, um, and then maybe you know 10% learning about how to distribute it. And that might be something worth thinking about. You know, maybe if you realize that it's a, a, a significant thing, you might want to research what kind of film festivals show films like the films that I make. So maybe those film festivals would be the places I would go to with my film and not waste a year and many submission fees on festivals that won't show this kind of film. Um, so that you can either educate yourself more about that or you can also use different platforms, but when I say platforms, I don't only mean online platforms, I mean also festival markets. If you can afford it and if you can allow yourself to do it, go to markets, be present in the markets, meet distributors, meet festival programmers, because um, it does make a difference. And I'm not saying that a programmer is going to take a film because they met the filmmaker, but it does make a difference when you put a face to, you know, 5,000 applications, it has an impact. Um, yeah, so, so basically, you do have to do a lot of work on your own. Don't rely on other people to do the work for you, but try to find what are the ways that I can get educated about this field, what are the ways I can get exposed in this field. I have one more general question. If you're making a film, at what point do you factor in your audience? So you might think, okay, I want this film to be seen, or is it an expression of something I want to make and I want to create, and it's very personal, or should filmmakers be taking into account their audience in the development process. So the, there's a sentence that um, in one of our panels that we did in Cannes, uh, Kathleen McLinnis, who's uh, on our advisory board, she said, um, every film has an audience, even if that audience is just your parents, mm -hmm. it's an audience. Um, and you have to think, um, what kind of audience do I want to reach, and then make the plan accordingly. And if your goal is to reach you know, 10 million views on YouTube, mm -hmm. then you have to th see you know, what are the right ways to reach that. But if your goal is to make your way into the film industry, then you have to see which festivals are right for that and which festivals allow you to also promote your next project. Mm -hmm. Because it's always about thinking of how does what I'm doing right now help me make my next step and not only this one film. Yeah. No, it's very interesting. And I think looking at, well, you mentioned different ways in which you can get your film seen by audiences, whether it's in the cinemas, whether it's online, whether it's looking at different technologies, does impact a little bit how you might structure and how you might create content, what you want to leave in there, you know, what you want someone to, to see and perceive. So it, it is, I think it is something to be conscious of when you're making films, that you're not just thinking, okay, I want the film to look like this, but who do I really want to affect with the film? Right, I mean, it's a, it's a dangerous path, though, to, to ask filmmakers to, you know, change the stories they want to tell just because of the audience, mm -hmm. but I think you do have to be aware of it. So you do have to be aware that if you're having, let's say, a lot of nudity in your shorts is probably not going to be commercially distributed in the US, um, whereas it might be very successful in Europe. So, you know, there's like things to think about, but you have to think of what are the stories that you want to tell and how do you reach that audience that's relevant for what you want to tell. Don't change your stories because of where you think there's an audience, but more rather see what kind of audience your stories are fitting for. Do we have any questions for Amos specific Anos? <laughs> Okay, because I think that's quite a nice leeway into looking at different audiences and different technologies and ways that you're already looking at opportunities to create something new. So, Ian, I think we should go straight into your presentation. Um, Katie, do you mind setting up? Should we? Uh, we'll take a seat over here. Well, good 
afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming along today to hear what we have to say. Hopefully, we can give you some ideas to help you. Um, my name is uh, Ian Pennell. I'm a partner in a law practice in Mayfair called uh, New Media Law LLP, which um, I'm horrified to say I found out we set up 17 years ago. <laughs> so we're getting um, older and older. But we specialize in new media technology type of law, and obviously we do a lot of films. We have, I think, three full-time film lawyers and 20-plus lawyers that we have, so we're always advising on films um, and t television as well. Um, but today I wanted to focus on a couple of areas which I think could be uh, quite interesting for you guys that are coming into, into the, the sector. Uh, VR is something which you might have heard of, and um, we are all becoming aware of it, and I think it, is, it has a significant future. And I wanted to talk to you about it today and explain one of the experiences I've had quite recently with it um, and explain to you what <coughs> we can learn from that. And also just a quick look at artificial intelligence, AI, which again is another area of technology which is coming in and I think provides some great opportunities for you as you're entering the sector. So um, why do I want to look at VR particularly? Um, it's a brand new format. It's relatively uh, a recent invention. So we're dealing with something which, at the moment, hasn't really got uh, a, a sort of long history to it. And that gives you an opportunity, as new filmmakers, as young filmmakers, which is there is no great content out there. Um, and I think that's a really interesting dynamic where, you know, if you go into something, um, then it, that provides you with an opportunity. If there's no content out there, people are fighting to make the content, then, you know, then there's an opportunity for young filmmakers, if they want to embrace this, um, uh, then um, they can do that. And so the question then is, well, if I could embrace it, then why shouldn't it be me? And I think um, VR, and I'll, I'll take you through an experience um, which I've had with it very recently, which is ongoing, actually. But um, there are some limitations to the format that we found in, in, in the businesses we've been advising. Uh, and they're all really technical. You know, there's a latency to it. I don't know if you know what I mean by latency, but when you're immersed in the headset, um, obviously in the real world, if we spin our head, you know, our vision stays with us and it's pretty much um, real time. The, the, the amount of uh, pixels that are transferring in a, in a VR film, sometimes the latency just takes a little time for the image to catch up. And that's a problem which is just down to, would you believe computers not being powerful enough? I know I'm in a city where um, uh, you know, computers are very important. And uh, you, know, you wouldn't believe in this day and age that we're still saying they're not powerful enough. Well, with VR, they're not, but they're getting there. So the pixelation is, is a problem as well, <laughs> potentially. But it also, I think, could be um, an opportunity because it provides a particular style and, and approach. Um, what we found with some of the clients that we've been working with is that the close-up immersive content, so if you put yourself in a situation where there's a lot of things around you in a close environment, that works very well, and that kind of content is great. Um, but if you're going to film, as one of our filmmakers did, a cheetah running past you in a, a jungle, you know, well, that's not so good. You know, it, the pixelation and the latency really hurts you. And a lot of the time we're also, why I think it works really great with short films is because of those technical hitches, um, it, you don't really want to be immersed in that headset for too long. Um, some people do complain of having a sort of slightly weird feeling. And so you tend to find the films are short. And you know, even if Warner Brothers attack this format tomorrow, or uh, MGM or whoever, the fact is they can't make great big long films because our brains can't quite cope with a long time in a VR environment. So what does that mean? Short filmmakers have an advantage. Um, the technology is coming up to speed, and that's great, and it's getting better and better. Uh, you know, and I think what that means is that there's going to be more opportunities, and it's going to get bigger and bigger. But the, the big problem, and um, some of you may have seen the VR headsets that are downstairs. I don't know if anyone noticed those as they came in. So that's from um, a company, a French company, called Wild Immersion, which is one of our clients of which we're very involved with. And um, it's run by a chap called Adrien Moisson. He's an ex veterinary surgeon who's trying to change the planet by uh, making people more aware of great wildlife experiences and trying to encourage people through experience that they should protect that. And I, I recommend, if you haven't already looked, do please go and have a look at the Wild Immersion 
films, they're really fascinating and fantastic films. But the problem that Adrienne came up with after investing a lot of money um, in, in filming all this fantastic content, what am I going to do with it? So I've got all this great VR content, but if you go into the Odeon in the high street, there's no VR, uh, uh, VR headsets there yet. So the next issue you meet with is with the exploitation. So you can look at that as a problem. Well, if I make my VR short, how am I going to get people to look at it? But actually, you can also see that as an opportunity. VR can go anywhere. And I'm going to show you a little bit, a couple of films of wild immersion in action, where we've set up, for example, a cinema within a cinema, and we do it in the foyer of the cinema. We don't need a darkened room with the, with the windows blocked out, because you can take the headsets literally, when if you've got noise-cancelling headphones, you could literally have a cinema on a street. Think about that for a second, and then you'll realise why, wow, there are some real opportunities here. It can go anywhere. So cinemas, uh, as I say, you know, Wild Immersion, uh, we did a deal, which I did, with Pathé in Paris. So now um, uh, you can go into a Pathé cinema, you can buy a ticket online, walk into the cinema, except instead of walking into the dark room over there, you actually walk into an area of cinema where you can put on a VR headset. And people are paying for that, and it's, it's doing very well in Paris, and we're going to see that rolling out. Um, and also, again, Wild Immersion is a good example of it, Theme parks, a fantastic success. Only two weeks ago, uh, Wild Immersion launched a, a theme park experience at the Jardin d'Acclimatation in Paris, uh, with a, and that's now having 1,200 uh, users per day, customers per day, coming in to watch um, a 12-minute uh, short. So there you go, a short film making money. You know? So I wanted to get that across to you and explain that. This, just to show you, is... Um, uh, this is... Uh, Pathé, see if I can get it. Uh, ooh, okay. I may need somebody technical. <laughs> okay, great, thank you. So this just shows you um, what's happened at Pathé in Paris. This is one of the uh, Pathé cinemas. And you can see, so this is one immersion. of exploiting um, so uh, there's a good example you know anywhere where you've got people standing around bored right think about how many times we get bored I said to somebody what's the worst experience with a theme park it's pretty obvious isn't it it's the queuing so there you go you've got people queuing in a theme park what are they doing with that time they can be doing something useful so you can build a VR theater and you can take your content there and entertain them so I think that's a fantastic opportunity Similarly, how often are we standing around an airport, someone's cancelled a flight somewhere, and we're waiting for the plane? What are we doing with that time? There's only a limited amount of duty-free you want to buy, isn't there, because you've got to carry on the plane. Um, uh, you know, so airport lounges, fantastic opportunity. You might even go as far as um, train stations. We're all standing around a lot of the time there, so if we know we've got 20 minutes to wait and we want to watch a short film for 12 minutes, we can do it. So where else can that go? You know, let's think about where that can go, what the potential for it is. And the answer is, it goes wherever your imagination takes you. So I think VR, in particular, uh, offers some fantastic opportunities for young filmmakers to explore the medium and go where, at the moment, uh, no one else is going. 
but uh, that will change quickly. And then just quickly on uh, uh, AI, so why do I want to bring this to your attention today? Well, according to the World Economic Forum, 70% of the jobs that exist today will not exist in 30 years, and any task that typically does not involve more than one minute of thinking to complete will apparently be automated. Um, you can believe that or not, as the case may be. Um, so I think there's a real opportunity there for filmmakers to look at that and say, well, you know, well, how can we involve ourselves with AI? What can we be doing? Again, it's a new format, it's a new type of technology. And I think it's really exciting, and it's not an area where a lot of people are going into. So you can think, well, perhaps I can involve myself in that. Um, where would it go? Uh, I just thought of two examples for you here. Clearly, uh, medicine, films about medicine, films about how to, to do operations, those films will go worldwide. We're talking uh, to one particular hospital in Los Angeles where it's a teaching hospital, they have 30,000 staff, they're experts on particular operations. Well, can we film that? Can we put that into an AI context? And can we then uh, take that to other hospitals around the world that don't necessarily have that knowledge? And they're very excited about that. Um, and I think that's an example, well, you know, young filmmakers can, can grab those opportunities because there are lots of them out there. Another example, clearly, industry, uh, AI can be very powerful within industry, and, and we know about that. Um, and then I just wanted to, uh, uh, to mention, and actually it was Bernadette who drew this to my attention. I don't know, uh, uh, for those of you who've come across uh, the HoloLens by Microsoft, but that's a very interesting product, uh, mixed reality smart glasses by Microsoft. So again, it's another uh, type of, of, of technology which is coming through now. Um, and you know, the, the films that, and uh, the way these things are used and the films that go with them will all be brand new. And the advantage you have is there's, there's an open playing field. You know, there's not going to be that much content which is made for these formats. So it's an example where young filmmakers can get ahead of the game, and so Microsoft say that these are their second version of HoloLens is uh, business orientated. Uh, they tell us that they're fully immersive. Immersive is a word you'll see a lot in AI and a lot in uh, VR. Uh, they like the ergonomics of them, and they, they say they're business friendly. So, you know, there's another example. And I just wanted to, uh, to finish really with a little uh, film. Hopefully, I can get it functioning just to show you a little bit about the HoloLens. And there it is. So, um, yeah, the point that I wanted to make there really was that these new technologies I think are really exciting for young filmmakers. I think there's an opportunity. I think you can grab it. And I think you, you, you've got a fairly open playing field. And if I was going to set my stall up as a great young filmmaker, I would attack some of these new technologies and I would get out there and, and, and make my name in this area. Sure, you can go back to doing 2D, but who knows? You know, 3D and uh, VR may actually become a major format quicker than we think. Great. Great. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
passionate about the audience question. So I think it's fascinating, and I think where, where technology can take us is really quite astounding. A little bit frightening, I think, to people who are coming from traditional filmmaking backgrounds. Gosh, if that's where it's going, do I need to adapt quickly, and do I need to try and get ahead of a, a curve? Should be one of the front runners and one of the, the known filmmakers who is uh, exploiting this type of technology. Now, for young filmmakers, I think this is exciting. I'd like to be a part of it. How accessible is the industry, and how easy is it to say, okay, I think I have got a good idea for an immersive experience that I'd like to bring to audiences, but how do you feasibly go about making that? Is it that you know you're commissioned? For example, you mentioned being in theme parks or in in, uh, in queues or in airports. Is it that the airport is commissioning a company to make VR re ready for it, or, or how do you actually go about making something and then selling it? Well, I think it's a brand new area. So you know, um, Adrienne and Wild Immersion have been sort of trailblazing this, and, and I think uh, what they've done in Paris is is, is a world first. So. Uh, this is an area which I think will expand quickly and how I think you get into it is you need to do your research like anything else and you find out well who's making VR films now and, and if they're commercial is it an ad agency is it some kind of production company that's working for an ad agency so you get in there and you express your interest now ideally as with anything else you have a demo you know so uh, the good news is the camera costs have come way down um, so the GoPro system, I think you can rent one pretty cheaply, uh, and it's basically six GoPros in a queue, mm -hmm. and you need a piece of software to hook that together to create this 360 uh, environment. But that's all well within the budget now of an independent filmmaker to make, show what they can do. And then if I was going into that, I would send that out to the ad agencies, I'd send that out to the creative studios and the, and the production companies and say, hey, I'm here you know, and I'm ready for business if you have a project. And I think you'll find a lot of brands will be interested in this as a, as a way of you know, showing what they can do, and they're going to be commissioning a lot of short films. So that's where you start. And, you know, we all have heard of some great filmmakers who've started commercial before they've gone into making their own features. And that's what we see a lot with Water Sprite. We have a lot of filmmakers come through, and the first thing that they do is either go into making commercials whilst they're developing a different project yeah. that they, they end up wanting to do. And so, so you recommend setting up for your own company and then kind of planting that seed and that idea into big businesses with the I, I don't think that as a filmmaker, you don't necessarily need your own company to do that. But, but for me, I think as with anything else, you know, you've got to show what you can do. So you know, if you send in an email and say, hi, hey, I'd really like to shoot some VR for you, they're going to question that and say, well, how do we know that we can trust you with the budget? Mm -hmm. So, you know, your best bet is, is to get hold of a, a VR camera and do something creative with it, and then, you know, use that as your demo. And the great news is there's not a lot out there. You know, there's not a lot of competition. Uh, you know, with Adrienne and Wild Immersion, I don't know anyone else who's doing what he's doing. Yeah. It's very interesting. I mean, I've come across different VR films, especially at festivals, looking at more traditional festivals or art house festivals like Rotterdam, Cannes, you know, they have their VR corners and they're starting to also expand their boundaries of traditional cinema and say, these new technologies, and these are films that give you a whole different experience of, of consuming content. Now, what I've found interesting is the trend from the VR footage I've come across in the VR films is that they tend, because they're so immersive, they tend to raise awareness about an, an, an issue. So they, this is a great example of wildlife and looking at uh, what we can do. I know that Wild Immersion partners with the Jane Goodall Foundation. In case you don't know who Jane Goodall is, she lived with the chimpanzees and she's an incredible, incredible lady and front runner in the natural preservation um, wildlife world. And so, you know, part of the profits of Wild Immersion go towards the Jane Goodall Foundation as well. They're working in a close partnership. And it's a way that you can, you can feel and see and be in the, in the wildlife that you wouldn't have a chance to be in Normally, and another another film that I saw was a refugee film, um, which we saw in Cannes with, with Lacey. And, uh, and that puts you in the shoes. It, and it wasn't just documentary, it was actually um, a, a staged piece. And that was quite revolutionary in its way, that it was a fiction, mm -hmm. 15 minutes short. And you were in a house that was being bombed and you had to make the decision to leave the house and leave behind the grandmother because she wasn't going to be able to come. And with that dilemma that you feel, and do you go with your newborn baby and try and save yourselves, or do you leave someone behind? 
And so it's quite hard. I mean, you come out of some of these films feeling really quite moved, quite emotionally drained. But I think it's, it's interesting what, what we saw in the, in the Wild Emotion film. It says, you know, everyone has any responsibility, everyone has an impact. And really using VR films as a way to raise impact and to raise awareness and have impact on audiences. So do you think that that is a trend in which a new technology is really coming to the forefront because it is a, a vessel for change? Well, technology is always changing. And, and uh, you know, this, this opportunity reminds me, you know, I've done a lot of work in my career within the music industry, and I can remember when digitization hit the music industry, um, they, they, the, the powers that be in the record companies had no clue what it meant or what it was going to do, and it, it radically overthrew the business. And it did that because it interrupted the distribution model. The distribution model was you had to go to a record company, get some money, make a record, and then they chose where it was distributed, not you. Well, this does the same thing to the film industry. At the moment, if you're trying to make money as a filmmaker, you're probably looking at two main opportunities, which is theatrical and then TV broadcast. You know, those are, you know, DVD, I think, the, it's, it's a thing of the past, isn't it? So you're looking at theatrical and, and, and uh, broadcast. Well, hang on a minute. If I'm right and my prediction is right and you start to see VR theatres grow up on street corners, well, that's a whole new distribution channel, which, frankly, the major uh, film companies have no control over. It is as radical as that, as, as a digital song being emailed to you because um, you know, Karl Heinz Brandenburg invented the MP3 and suddenly we were able to email tunes to each other, which we couldn't before that. You know? So I think it's a potentially a, a radical change to the business and I think that's exciting for new filmmakers, particularly in the shorts sector, because at the moment the technology doesn't work with a long film. You can't spend an hour in VR, you come out going, what was that all about? My brain isn't functioning properly. And actually, they've, they've had some studies that, that have caused you know, some problems with certain people if they spend too much time in it. There's nothing medically wrong with it, but you have to be cautious. OK, you don't want someone who comes out of a VR theater and then you know, gets run over in the street because they haven't they've become disorientated. Yes. So the short films are perfect for it. Um, with Adrian, what he's done in Paris, uh, and this literally opened 10 days ago in Paris with uh, 1,200 uh, viewers a day already. Um, it's a 12-minute film. So, you know, people come in, they put the headset on, they watch some fantastic wildlife experiences for 12 minutes, and then it's finished. Not one of them, actually, that's not true. I did see a four-year-old crying when the tiger got a bit too close, right? But apart from a four-year-old, everyone loves it, and they walk away going, what a great experience. So do you think that audiences are ready for VR? Are they mature enough for VR? According to this experiment, they are, but only within this short sector. If you tried to find a product which you said, right, I want you to go into a theatre and watch this for an hour and a half, I'm not sure they are ready, but I think that's the technical mm -hmm. problem. That's not... And it's also because it's a brand new format, so new is always different, isn't it? You but know? I think there is that. There's, there's that novelty around having this new experience and especially for we see it downstairs in that hub when people are trying VR and they've never had a VR headset on before they're like wow that's so interesting it's so exciting yeah so it's always a question well, well do you think that that novelty factor will wear off or is that something that's just going to become the norm well I think it's uh, you know again I come back to the experience of the music industry you know I tell anyone trying to break the music industry it's very simple write a hit you know if you've got a song which is irresistible can't be uh, you know I remember one chap who everyone thought you know was probably not going to have a great career he didn't really look the part as a singer and then he wrote a song called human mm -hmm. and it was a massive worldwide hit and suddenly everyone knows who he is so i think it's the same within the vr and the filmmaking if you can go out there and think what can i do with this format which is a brand new format and you can create something dramatic right where people say i want to see that you know there's a there's a new dramatic thing which is apparently amazing on vr if you are the person that creates that people will come to you, because that's the secret. What is the creative spark that makes the technology come alive? You know, I, we did a, a big deal with Lenovo computers uh, for Wild Immersion. Lenovo um, are selling these headsets into school rooms because technology, uh, the studies show that you learn a lot more in a VR environment than you do in a classroom environment with, a, with a, somebody talking to you. They store more information when they're immersed in it. So if those studies come through, which I think they will, you'll find suddenly all the classrooms, not every classroom, but every school will have a VR classroom. Lenovo are targeting that, and Lenovo found that, hang on a minute, when they send these things to the schools, the schools are coming back saying, it all looks great, it all looks lovely, but what does it do? 
And so they thought, okay, we need some content which is language uh, agnostic, right? And also school level agnostic. So anyone, let's say above four, after the experience of the four-year-old in Paris, but anyone from five up can watch this without it having to be graded uh, uh, with a certification. And they found wild immersion, said this is perfect. It's wild animals in their natural habitat. We don't need any language. We can send it to any school immediately. So every single education headset coming out of Shenzhen has wild immersion preloaded on it. So there's an example where the, the, you know, that was sought out by Lenovo. You know, Adrian didn't knock on their door. Yeah. Well, we won't go into wild immersion too much because tomorrow we actually do have a dedicated event on, on wild immersion. But I'd like to invite Amos back up to the front and, uh, and sort of conclude because we know, we've looked at two very different ways to find new audiences and looking at opportunities in it. And, and I want to see, first of all, if we have any specific questions from the audience about either of, of, of Amos's presentations or Ian's presentations. Oh, very good. Okay, so I like that there are no questions. In that case, I'd like you to maybe conclude how you, what you would like to give to filmmakers who are now going into, into their next steps. I mean, do you say there's any top tips of advice of having worked with so many young talents or professionals that you think these are, these are really good ways in which you can sort of structure your next steps? Um, oh, I think in the, in the context of, of VR and, and interactive cinema or, or experiences, I think it's, um, it's really exciting new opportunities, but at the same time, um, you do have to keep in mind that not everything to do with video and um, storytelling is cinema. And you really do have to ask yourself, what do I want to do, what do I want to make, what kind of stories or what kind of experiences do I want to give? Um, and then find your path to that. And um, it's very difficult not to get confused along the way. I think commercials and, and you know, um, let's say, um, instructional videos are a great way to get an income for many students and young alumni from different film schools. But you do have to keep in mind that if you want to do cinema, um, then it's not that. And it might be possible to do it parallel, but you always have to keep in mind, is this the track that I want to be on? Um, and if not, then, then you have to look at it again. But if that's what you want to do and it's great, then there are so many new opportunities, both technologically and storytelling wise. I think for, for, for me personally, because I, I did have a little bit of experience with um, interactive videos myself, I feel like the, like the traditional storytelling is simply not working in VR and it's more of, of an experience. It's more of a, an immersive experience that you give the audience. That's why maybe I think this animal experience is so interesting because that is what it is. It's an experience. You don't, I, I haven't watched it yet, so I don't know, but I'm guessing that the jaguar is not like trying to get something and then at the end he gets it, right? Or something like that. There's no get. <laughs> so there's, there's no story that you have to follow. It's just an experience. And in that sense, that's what works, in my opinion, in those kind of um, non-linear uh, stories. Um, but then again, if what you want to do is be a storyteller, that might not be right for you. So really keep in mind, is this what I want to do? Is this interesting to what I want to achieve? And if not, then just think if that's what you want to do. Uh, yeah, I, I, the only comment I have on that is I think it is possible to work in the commercial world and build experience and build a name. And then uh, having achieved that, then to cross over from that to something purely creative. So I, I wouldn't discount that as a route. <laughs> there are some filmmakers who've done it. I know, absolutely. Um, but yeah, no, I agree with that. But I think it's, it, these are new formats and they're exciting new areas where you can you build a name for yourself. And, uh, and I think that the opportunities are there, which is much harder to get into making a feature film which is going to go on a, on a um, commercial release. Completely. Well, if, if there aren't any specific questions from the audiences, we can, we can do it a little bit more informally afterwards. I really recommend that you do try out the VR headset, especially now that we've gone into it. And Ian will be around to sort of take any specific questions about it for that and, and for that experience also from, from the commercial side. And Amos has got a wealth of experience of looking at marketing shorts and kind of strategies specifically for your different stages. So whether you're a first-time director of a feature film, whether you just come out of film school, whether you want to know about film, fest film, fe film festival strategy, you know, how do you actually structure it? 
and Alice has agreed very kindly to, to meet with you kind of one-on-one -on -one throughout the weekend. And we've got this room for about half an hour afterwards as well where, where you, you can come approach us, speak to Alice and, and ask for specific tips that you might have for your project. Um, we should also just mention that with Teaport, at the moment, it's a great online marketplace and it's a way to really get your film out there, get it seen by programmers. Until now, it's been the film schools that have been uploading the films for their students. But I believe from June, yeah. Yeah. individuals, students themselves, will have the chance to upload their own films independent of the schools. So it's a great way for, for you to also get your, your content on that site through the selection process. Right, and then that's why we opened the pre-registration now. So if anybody's interested in, in getting that first in June, make sure to pre-register so that you'll be first on the list. Um, are you a graduate? Um, I'm a sort of working for one, so... Okay. Um, no, it's... Once we start opening it to individual submissions, um, the, the limitations are a lot broader. Um, so if it's a young alumni, let's say that the qualification is if you have not yet made your first feature film, mm -hmm. and if, if you're considered still a young talent, a young filmmaker, it's not about age, it's about where you are in your career. Um, so that's more the orientation of where we focus. Until now we've worked purely with film schools uh, because the way we worked is also directly with the school. Uh, but once we're opening it up, of course, it's, it's going to be a lot broader. Uh, but still, our, our, our focus is young talent, film students, young alumni, people that are making their first steps in the industry. And uh, just in that context, maybe w worth mentioning, um, there's an article I read once, and unfortunately I don't remember who wrote it. Um, but one of the things they said there, which really stood out for me, which might be interesting for everybody in this room, is they were talking about people starting their way in the industry and, and making their first steps in the industry. And they were saying, um, if you're in the beginning of your filmmaking career, and by beginning I mean the first 15 years. <laughs> so, uh, That's amazing. <laughs> so don't be discouraged. It's not just you. It takes time. Uh, we're here to try and help make that time shorter. It does take time. And just so we all understand, so that, is that just for short fiction projects or documentary? No, no, no. No, no, we have animation films, we have documentary, we have experimental, we have fiction, we have everything. VR? Uh, we have actually had requests for VR films. Unfortunately, we haven't found any film schools that make VR projects. Uh, it's an opportunity so it, if you want to start Again, film it's school. a question of content. <laughs> I uh, rest my case. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, uh, we, we, we're happy. My job is done. Yeah. We're, we're happy to work with, with anything that's relevant for, for young emerging talents. Um, as long as, as there is the content, so yeah. All right, brilliant. Um, quickly, before we finish, I just want to say um, thank you for coming. We have lots more events coming up uh, over the next couple of days, so please join us at those. And um, please join me in saying a final thank you to 